Here's another one talking about automation and uh, biotech. As genome editing moves from the lab into the clinic, the ethical debate is no longer hypothetical. Now, this is from the World Economic Forum, and uh, they just had a meeting of the Global Futures Council. So this is real, folks. This is real. This is not uh, this is not a drill. This is not a drill. Designer babies have featured in media headlines following the publication in July of a landmark report, Genome Editing and Human Reproduction, Social and Ethical Issues by the UK's highly respected New Field Council on Bioethics. These headlines may catch the eye, but do not do justice to the much more nuanced discussion in, that the New Field Council's report promotes. The report considers the ethics of intentionally altering the DNA of a human embryo or the sperm and eggs that preceded to change the characteristics of a future person in ways that could be inherited by future generations. It concluded that these interventions could be morally acceptable in some circumstances, but these circumstances do not yet and may never exist. <clears throat> At present, British law prohibits such interventions, and the council concludes that much needs to happen before any reform to the law should be contemplated, as countries around the world are engaging in their own national level discussions about genome editing. This report offers a fresh perspective in response to the fundamental question of how far people should be allowed to exercise their preferences they may have for their child for their future child. What can genome editing do? The Newfield Council's review was prompted by the emergence of powerful new scientific techniques known as gene editing that enabled deliberate, precisely targeted changes to be made to DNA in living cells. Differences in DNA can account for why some people are tall and others short, some athletic and others not, and why some people are born with devastating life-limiting inherited diseases. The CRISPR-Cas9 technique is the undisputed poster child of genome editing. It has been game-changing for scientific research, enabling genetic alterations to be made many times faster and more easily than by using previous techniques. Other techniques used to use radiation, which was harder to use, more unpredictable, and uh, left a lot more um, mutations. So the CRISPR is a lot more precise. So that's what they're saying. Genome editing is beginning to move from the laboratory to the clinic. A number of clinical trials are in progress. See that, folks? Using genome edited cells to treat disease in, in patients. The technique also has applications in livestock and crop breeding to select traits that can improve the efficiency of food production. But it is the prospect of heritable genome editing in order to influence the characteristics of a future person and in turn those that may come after them that has attracted the greatest attention and contestation. Think GMO for people. Why might people want this? There are good reasons why one might want to use genome editing in a reproductive context. Inherited, dis inherited diseases such as sickle cell disease, metathalassemia, Thai sex disease, cystic fibrosis, and Huntington's diseases are incurable and life-limiting conditions. They cause real distress to prospective parents who know in advance that any child they conceive will have calculable likelihood of being affected. But there are also some not-so-good reasons for wanting to use genome editing, such as a desire to produce children who are more athletic or more intelligent than the norm. Although genome editing offers little real prospect of achieving this and would probably be less effective than physical training or a well-stocked library, most observable traits, including diseases, are the result of a complex interaction of multiple genetic and environmental factors. Nonetheless, intentional intervention into the human genome continues, understandably, to provoke acute human anxieties and elicit strong moral responses. It is worth bearing in mind that 
even in the case of serious inherited diseases, prospective parents have options. Existing methods such as prenatal testing or assisted conception combined with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis may enable them to have genetically related children while excluding a disease trait identified in the family. And then there are routes such as egg and sperm donation and adoption. However, there may be some very rare cases in which these are not suitable options and where genome editing could conceivably offer additional advantages. Individuals are responsible for their particular choices, but it is science and society that provide people with options. Science and society do not stand still. Not only must we consider these situations in which genome editing might be used, but also the processes by which such technologies might enter into use in the reproductive context. If we find ourselves with a safe, effective technique of genome editing in the future, the question changes from can it do this to what else can we do with it? Now is the time for debate. Until now, perhaps for some time to come, no technique for altering DNA has been deemed safe enough to use in human reproduction. In many jurisdictions, including the 29 countries that are bound by the Council of Europe's Ovidio Convention and others that are not, such as the UK, Germany, and China. Wow. Germany and China. The deliberate heritable alteration of the human genomes is unlawful. But in many other countries, it is not explicitly prohibited. The Newfield Council on Bioethics report argues that we need to start thinking now about what might be good and bad reasons to pre-select certain characteristics of future people, if it ever becomes technically feasible to do so. We should do this soberly and circumspectly. While the science is in its relative infancy, and before the time comes when the placards are painted, asserting prospective parents' rights to use the technique, and certainly before national legal authorities must make decisions on behalf of society. Recognizing that the assisted reproduction industry is global in nature, the Council emphasizes the importance of international dialogue and global cooperation, including recommending that the UK must work actively and constructively with other countries to develop a framework that respects the values of different countries and safeguards human rights. After careful reflection, the Newfield Reports concludes that heritable genome editing of humans is not inherently unacceptable. It proposes two principles to guide the formulation and applications of governance. Should the procedure ever be con contemplated? First, such interventions must be intended to secure and be consistent with the welfare of the future person. This means that not only must the technique be clinically safe, but such interventions should promote the future person's psychosocial welfare. Secondly, the policies and arrangements governing the use of the technique should not increase social injustice, discrimination, or, or division, or otherwise disadvantage groups in society. It should not be used to benefit some at the expense of others. We'll see how far that goes. Guided by these two principles, the report makes 15 recommendations addressed to research organizations and governments in the UK and elsewhere, should they be inclined in the future to permit genome editing. But before then, there is a need for a broad and inclusive public debate, not only or not primarily as an instrument to inform national policy decisions but in order for society to understand, articulate, and critique the content and contours of the public interest in genome editing. The complex interrelated moral norms and values which such interventions might implicate should be deliberately and openly explored. Slogans and catchphrases such as those featured in media headlines surrounding the report are not effective vehicles for nurturing these important and increasingly urgent discussions. That is a lot, but this is really important. This is the first step. And if they're talking about it, they've already done it. Now they want to make it legal. If I had money and this technique was out there, 
and I wanted a surrogate baby, I might have this done. If it hasn't been done already, we may already have super babies out there that we don't know about. Who knows? Usain Bolt could have been one of those babies. And we could have a bunch of superhuman beings running around already. Like I said, running around already. Well, folks, this is coming and this is just the first step. We are at the elbow. I keep telling you, we are at the elbow. And Kansas is getting ready to go bye bye. All the stuff that we have known in the past is going to go bye bye really, really quickly. And with artificial sperm, as they call it, and artificial eggs, as they call it, that are actually uh, made and produced instead of um, formulated from human beings. Once they perfect that, I do think they're going to perfect it within the next 10 years. Um, you're going to have manufactured, I say you're going to have manufactured babies by 2050. I really think you're going to have manufactured babies by 2050. And so in 30 years, you're going to have manufactured babies. And there's other things that could come with that. But this is the first step, the first legal step. Keep an eye on this. Keep an eye on the new field. The new field papers, because they're setting legal precedents. And once they do that, you can best believe Germany and China are not going to go with the normal flow, especially China. China believes if it can be done, it should be done. Damn the ethics. And if China does it, then well, sure, the United States is going to do it. Nobody's going to lose the race. But anyway, it's been long enough. With that, I'm going to jump off of here. This is BGS out, and I will see you guys on the next one.